invite you to your chairs if I could, and you can open your Bibles to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 4. We have entered the final chapter of our lengthy study in this marvelous book. We're going to be looking at verses 4 through 7 this morning. 4, 5, 6, and 7. Philippians chapter 4. There's a number of times in my life in pastoral ministry where I have been amazed at God's providence (laughs) of preparing either a passage or a song uh, in advance of anyone knowing how appropriate that passage is, and that is the case this morning. Uh, The Lord (laughs) knows what we need before we do. So let's begin reading, and let's remember as we read, this is God's Word, full of His authority, describing His character, and inviting us to know Him. Let's read beginning in verse 4 of chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in prayer, in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word. Yesterday I was walking towards two of my son's soccer game. And as I was going, the game had just started, and my three-year-old saw me from across the field and just came racing towards me with a big grin on his face, and I think he crossed over part of the field to get there. Um, He was just thrilled that I was going to be there, and he wanted me to hold him. And then later in the day, uh, after I got home from some work, he was... Uh, wanting me to be outside with him while he played. He wanted me to stay with him while he was doing what he was doing with his trucks and so forth. And then in the end of the day, he wanted me to read him a book before he went to bed. So it, it, it struck me that if somebody didn't know me and my little son, but they just observed us, they could discern things about our relationship. They could discern that he loves me, that he trusts me, that I love him, that I enjoy him, that I enjoy seeing him and being with him, that he is dependent on me in some ways, that I care for him. They could, you could see that just by observing us, even if you didn't know anything about us other than just observing our lifestyle together. Well, the same thing is true in our relationship to the Lord. And it is that relationship that is the, the unifying theme of these verses. There's, there's three main commands in these verses, three sections of commands. Paul is, is calling the Philippian church to joy. He's calling them to a kind of reasonableness, or there might be gentleness. And he's also calling them to a prayerfulness that is not anxious and is full of thanksgiving. So there's commands in this passage, but it's very important that the commands not distract us from the foundation. The foundation of this passage is relationship. And so before we launched into the commands, I I wanted to pull out of the passage the relational language of this verse so that we can see that, that like my son, our relationship to the Lord is meant to be revealed in our life. Our life should reveal our relationship to Jesus. Or another way you could say it is the Lord of our life should shape the character of our life. This isn't just a passage about moralism, like Christianity is not a religion just trying to get people to behave certain ways. Don't worry, be happy. 
No, that, that is not the message of the Bible. The message of the Bible is come to know God or realize that God has made himself known to you and in that relationship, act accordingly. It's a child running across a field to his father, requesting care before bedtime, wanting to be close to him. That is the nature of this passage, but we could miss it if we're prone to zero in on commands as if this book is only about behaviors and not about relationships. So before we get into the three commands, I just want to pull out the relational components of this passage. Notice in verse 4, if you look down at your Bibles, notice this, and this will be behind me as well. You can watch. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Now we just skip over that phrase, but that is the heart of that command. Rejoice in the Lord in the Lord. It's a reference to our union with Christ, our connection to him, the fact that we are now united to our Savior, that he is our Lord. We have a, a king that dominates our life, that defines who we are. Rejoice in the Lord always. Notice that relational word right there. Then he, he goes to command number two, let your reasonableness, might be translated gentleness, be known to everyone. And then he inserts right after that command this Almost, you could think out of place, abrupt fact, the Lord is at hand. It means the Lord is near to us. It's just sort of inserted in the middle of these commands. The Lord is near. The point is, Paul is not just after behavior. He's after behavior that reflects relationship. The Lord is near. So why should you rejoice and be gentle and not worry and pray? Because the Lord is near. Your Lord is near to you. He is near, ready to lift you up, ready to care for you, ready to rescue you, ready to shower his love and goodness on you. The Lord is at hand. He is right here at your right hand, ready to be with you. There's a, a relational proximity that colors everything about this passage. It's the reason why we should be the way we should be. The Lord is at hand. Then keep going. He goes to the third command. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request, notice this, be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds. Another relational word, in Christ Jesus. So notice the passage is bracketed. Rejoice in the Lord. The Lord is at hand. Make your request known to God. There will be peace for your hearts and minds that will guard you in Christ Jesus. To describe this passage, and there's many like this in the New Testament, as merely behavioral is to delete the heart of the passage. We must not do that, and we must not delete it out of our lives as well. How easy is it, if you've been a Christian any length of time, how easy is it to mostly define your Christian life in terms of maintaining certain characteristics? I'm generally not a thief. I, I'm generally nice to my children. We have maintained our our relational unity for the most part in our home. We, we basically follow all the laws. We are basically kind. We, we don't watch things normally that are too egregiously sinful. We try to be nice to our neighbors. We attend church on Sunday morning. And you could reduce the Christian life to a kind of moralism with a nice face. Isn't it easy to do that, especially if you've been a Christian any number of years, just to think, look, I, I, I'm basically a nice person, and I, I'm not too anxious, and I'm basically joyful most of the time, I'm not too harsh with my children, and, and, and I've just become a good Christian person. We use that phrase even in the culture. Oh, he's a good Christian man. What do we mean by that? Well, we could mean he behaves a certain way. But the reality is in the Bible, behavior is meant to flow out of relationship. It's meant to be, be motivated by a relationship. We're supposed to be a certain way, yes, because our Lord is near. 
Because we know him, because we are in him, because he has invited us to cast all of our cares on him, we are not to be like, uh, if you've noticed, there's a recent trend when a tragedy strikes, certain popular figures are very uncomfortable now with saying prayers. And others try to extend the, uh, the, the, the language. So you'll have people that will say something like, I'm sending you my best wishes which is sort of meaningful, I guess. What's even less meaningful is the recent phrase, I'm sending you positive energy. (laughs) I've noticed that recently. I think it's kind of a non-religious way of avoiding saying I'm praying for you. I'm sending you positive religious energy, which physically and scientifically, any physicist will tell you, is absurd. Uh, You're not sending any kind of energy. (laughs) You're you're not sending any positive energy or negative. You're not a battery. Uh, This is not a plug-in. You're not sending positive energy. You're not sending wishes are meaningful, but, and then they'll, they'll combine the phrase, I'm thankful for the wishes, the positive energy, and the prayers. And you begin to wonder, is, is praying and, and nice behavior and kindness, is it just sort of a Christian behavioral set? Yes, I think so. It would be devastating for the church to assume that we are called to certain behaviors outside of relationship. Let me read the passage again and think about how devastating this would be for the church. Rejoice always. I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Don't be anxious about everything. But in everything, by well wishes and positive energy and prayers, be thankful. And your hearts might be at peace. How devastating for the church if the God of the church is taken out of the lifestyle of the church. Relationship. Our lives are supposed to look a certain way, but they're supposed to look that way because they flow out of relationship. Our lives are meant to reveal our relationship to Jesus, to God through Jesus. So let's look at these three commands, but let's look at them in the context of the relationship that we're meant to have with the Lord. There's three marks of this relationship that are commanded in this passage. The first is continuous joy. We are called to be continually joyful because we are in the Lord. In the Lord, people are continually to be rejoicing. Rejoice in the Lord always, Paul says. Again, I say rejoice. Now, joy has been a theme throughout this letter. It is important because Paul is suffering. He is in prison, probably in Rome, and the Philippians are facing some kind of trial as well. And so when he references joy repeatedly in the letter, he is teaching them the effect that being in Christ has when we go through suffering. When you go through suffering with Without Christ, all you have is your own resources and an uncertain future. When you go through Christ, through suffering in Christ, you have Christ and his promises, which makes any kind of suffering less significant and not able to steal your joy. We are to rejoice because we are in the Lord, because he has saved us, because he has rescued us, because he has brought us into a relationship with God, because he has forgiven all of our sins, because he has taken them as far from us as the east is from the west, because he has promised us a future and an inheritance. And whether you're having a good day or a bad day, or my transmission just broke day, or I don't have a a water heater anymore day, or my AC is out day, or I'm having a conflict with my spouse day, you can rejoice in the Lord, because you never have an I don't have the Lord day. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice. Joy is a required mark of a person who has relationship with Jesus. And the absence of joy reveals either a Christian who has been ignoring or neglecting their relationship with Jesus, or a person who has never known the Lord Jesus as their Lord and Savior. If you are noticing a lack of joy in your life, 
it could be because you are neglecting or holding at arm's length your relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Joy is a revealer. It's meant to be a mark of those who are in the Lord. What do you do in the Lord? You rejoice. Now, I am, I'm not talking about personalities here. I'm not talking about everybody should be the, the peppy personality. No, th- there's all kinds of different personalities. Some are more studious. Some are meditators. Some are, are exhilarated all the time. I mean, there, there's different personalities, but underlining all of them should be this concept of joy. I'm not saying, and Paul's not saying, that we just ignore suffering. We're just optimists. You know, what's that terrible sound in the car, Dad? It's nothing. It's nothing. It was going to work fine. Don't even talk about it anymore. No, that's not, Paul's not optimistic. Paul's very realistic about pain and suffering and, and, and feeling as though you're crushed but not driven to despair, as though you're broken but not destroyed. Paul is very familiar with that feeling. But underneath it all, there is a foundation of joy, such that Paul can command, rejoice in the Lord. I think this one verse also contradicts a Western idea that our emotions are outside of our control, that emotions happen to us. Rather than that, we control and are commanded to control our emotions. You're commanded to have joy in the Lord, which means... Emotions can't just be something that that happened to us. They are at some level ultimately under the control of our will. We're commanded to have joy. So when you wake up and you're on the wrong side of the bed or it's a terrible day because you didn't get your to-do list done yesterday or something's broken or some child has woken you up in the night, in that moment, we're called to have joy. Not because we just should but because we are in the Lord. You notice how the relationship makes all the difference here? Paul's not coming to that child on that soccer field and saying, smile. No, he's saying, smile because he is here. And he should be all you need to have joy. Rejoice in the Lord. We're called to be continually joyful. Does your joy reveal your relationship with Jesus? Does it? Some of you are models in this, and I just want to commend you. You are models, examples to me, where there is just a joy that exudes from you, whether you're suffering or you're not suffering. There is an ongoing joy, and I am grateful for your example. I know personally, I I can struggle. There are moments when I'm not being respected, when life has brought unexpected difficulties, when challenges come, that that I tend to be less joyful than at other times. I, I want to grow in being always joyful. Rejoice in the Lord, always. Again, I say, rejoice, Paul says. Second command, we're called to be gently gracious in Christ. Gently gracious. Why am I using that word? If you look at your Bibles, you notice that Paul's second command is let your reasonableness be known to everyone. That word reasonableness is hard to translate. Uh, so you, other translations you may have heard, gentleness. Um, it's a word that would be used, if you're talking about a king or a ruler, to describe a, a, a kind of leniency a graciousness towards his subjects. So obviously it's not referring to rulers here, but the idea is a a person who is kind of graciously flexible and and reasonable or gentle. It it doesn't just mean reasonable in the sense of, you know, he's a rational person, he's good at logic. That's not the idea. The idea is he's, he's, he's gentle, he's gracious, he's flexible, there's a leniency. He's not standing on rights. He doesn't have this sort of legal spirit towards others. He's not a a letter of the law kind of individual. You can imagine a a king or a ruler who's not looking to to nail someone to the wall for every infraction. That's the idea here. There's there's an understanding, there's a flexibility, a, a gracious gentleness. And when you see it that way, it's not hard to see why there's a connection between this word gentle reasonableness, or I've called it gentle graciousness, and the fact that the next verse says the Lord is at hand. 
Because the Lord who is at hand is the ultimate example of being gentle and, and patient and indulgent of weak and needy people. So try to imagine a scenario where you have a, a gracious, patient, and kind father who overhears in the next room one child berating another because of some infraction. You have not done it right. You have done it wrong. And I'm sure some of you, like I do, I have like the, the legal child and the non-legal child. And, and the legal child is, is driven crazy by the non-legal child. You don't do it right. The, the image here is of the fact when, when, a, when the father comes into the room, that should make a difference in how this one treats this one. Let your gentleness, your magnanimity, your graciousness, your godly indulgence be known to everyone. Now, this is obviously not acting as though we should be tolerant in the spirit of the age and not call sin, sin, or not rebuke one who is turning away from the Lord Jesus. Now, obviously, it's not referring to that. It's, it's saying that in our, our ordinary, everyday interactions, that weakness and, and failures not produce in us an indignation and a legal spirit of correction. It's saying, no, be, be reasonable. Be gracious. Be gentle. You're, you're not looking to find the flaw. Why? Well, the Lord is at hand. You remember that, that story uh, that Jesus told about the two servants of, uh, there's a servant of the king and he, he owes 10,000 talents and he's forgiven of his entire debt and then he, he goes out and he finds a fellow servant who owes him a, a much smaller amount of money and it's, the passage says he began to choke him Pay what you owe. I think that's something that's in view here. Paul would say that be, be reasonable. Be, be gentle. Be gracious. Don't, don't look to get what's yours. But here's the point. It's because the Lord is at hand. In light of the Lord's gentleness towards us, in light of his compassion and his indulgence of our weakness and our failures and our, our sins, let alone our lack of intelligence. Have you ever considered how condescending it is for God to listen to me talk? Have you ever found yourself frustrated with a, a small child who just can't, can't get across what they're trying to say? They start the same sentence... 12 times? Imagine what that's like for God. Listening to a person who has to do one word in front of the other in an order. What's that like for God? God indulges me every time I open my mouth. He's having to be more patient than any human being ever has to be. And that's the Lord that is at hand. And so when he sees these two infants, one berating the other and demanding on their rights, he, he comes and says, I, I think you can be patient with him. I, I think you can be reasonable. I think you can be magnanimous. I think you can be gentle. Why? Because you have been chosen by the most gentle, indulgent, patient, magnanimous Lord that has ever been known. The Lord is at hand, child. Be gentle, as he has been gentle with you. He has been gentle with me. The third command is to be prayerfully trusting. Prayerfully trusting. He starts this command with the, uh, the negative side of it, and then he moves to the positive side of it. He has a description, and then he has a promise. So you notice the negative side is, do not be anxious about anything. I, I don't know if there is a harder command to obey in the Bible. Do not be anxious about anything. To be anxious is to 
allow the uncertainty of an event to control your emotions. It's to allow the uncertainty of an event combined with your desire for a certain outcome to produce fear and to consume your mind. That's anxiety. It's thinking about something that's unknown and yet important and allowing that to shape your emotions more than your confidence in the Lord who is at hand. It's the mind that is fixed on the problem rather than fixed on the Lord. Isaiah says, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is fixed on you because he trusts in you. But the anxious man or woman says, my mind is fixed on the problem and I will not be at rest until it is solved or resolved. Do you know of a harder command to obey? Do not be anxious about anything. The moment you hear that noise in the car, don't be anxious about that. The moment you hear about layoffs at work, don't be anxious about that. The moment you see that leaking spot in the ceiling, don't be anxious about that. The moment you notice your child behaving in ways that are contrary to what you've taught them, don't be anxious about that. The moment the doctor frowns, don't be anxious about that. The phone call in the middle of the night, don't be anxious about that moralism cannot obey this command. Part of the reason I'm I'm, I'm bringing this relational component here is these commands are impossible apart from relationship with Jesus. So we relativize them. We say, well, I'm I'm less anxious than my worrying Aunt Gertrude. I mean, if you you would have known her, you would have known how peaceful I am. I am really peaceful. I mean, compared to my family, I have made a major breakthrough in anxiety. No, that's not the standard. The standard is the absence of anxiety. We need to be honest with ourselves about the commands to Christians in the New Testament. They are not relative commands. They're not be less anxious than your neighbor. Got it covered. Be less anxious than your grandma. Got it covered. Be less anxious than your spouse. Be less anxious than your child. No, no, no. Don't be anxious, ever. I can't do that, Lord. Have you ever had a moment, if, if, if you're a parent, there's moments with, with your children where I, I say to them, you're right, you can't do that. I had a moment with one of my children the other day where they were just struggling to obey, and they kept telling me, I can't. I can't do it. You're right. You can't. It's not good to define Christianity as something that we can do in our own strength. And you can't never be anxious. But the Lord is at hand. The Lord is at hand. The God of infinite power, perfect wisdom, who knows the future is at hand. The God who loves you is at hand. The God who cares for you is at hand. The God who knows what the noise is. The God who knows what is scurrying in your attic. That Lord is at hand. He's at hand right now. He's at hand with the child. You don't know where they are or what they're doing. He is at hand with you. He is near to you. He's near to me. So when he says, don't be anxious, he's saying, just stop worrying and just be happy by your own willpower. Just choose to be optimistic. He's saying, no, take those things that are outside of what you can control and hand them to me. Do not allow them to be your God. They may be good desires. They are bad gods. So this command then moves to what we should do. Well, Lord, what, what do I do? There, there is still something in the attic. Surely nothing. Sure, surely I, I can't just be passive. Surely this isn't just like close your eyes and just hope it goes away. I, that, that can't be what you're calling me to. No, there is something you can do to combat anxiety. That something is the positive command. Let your requests be made known to the Lord. The Bible is not recommending stoicism, okay? Very important to distinguish this. It's not recommending this idea that just don't care about anything. I I mean, whatever. 
if he if he the child falls off the jungle gym whatever I just won't worry I I won't worry about it but dear don't you think you should no I refuse to worry I refuse I refuse to worry about that don't you think you should check the oil in the car no no I will not be anxious I will not be anxious about things it's in God's hands. No, no, this isn't fatalism. This isn't kind of passivity, stoicism. I don't care about anything. God assumes we care about good things. But we're not to hold on to the care of them in anxiety. We're to hand over the care of them to the Lord. Do not be anxious about anything. Instead of that, here's what you can do. In everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God he uses three words probably just to emphasize the point prayer supplication thanksgiving they're not broadly distinguishable they're just saying the same thing repeatedly prayer supplication with requests what what doesn't fit under that category and he already said everything so the point is your life should be one of continually casting things outside of your control to God Everything. Small things and big things. Dreams and little desires. Casting them on the Lord. The, the image of this passage is, is one of, of relational magnetism. It, it's, it's like a magnet drawing us to God. We're in the Lord, so we should rejoice. The Lord is at hand. Be, be gentle with others. If you're having trouble with doing that, go back to who the Lord is and be be reminded of his gentleness, and then you can be gentle with someone else. And, and don't be anxious. Draw near to the Lord. Cast your cares on him, your requests, your prayers. Cast them on him. It, it's important to see anxiety not just as something we stop doing, but as something we stop doing by starting to do something else. You can't just not be anxious in a godly way. That is not what God intends. Stop being anxious. And just be blank. Have no desires. No, God intends stop being anxious and start praying. Let me give an illustration. Hold your fist up. Just like this. Just hold your fist up. If, if I were to tell you, if I were to tell you, open your hand, what would you do? Right. Now make a fist again. If I were to tell you, stop making a fist, what would you do? That's this command. Stop making a fist. Open your hand. The way a Christian stops being anxious is by starting to pray. You don't just stop being anxious. You start praying. Start praying, and in a particular way, start praying with thanksgiving. Notice the description there. Pray with thanksgiving. A person whose life reveals their relationship to Jesus is a person who knows there is an endless amount of things to be grateful for, so even our urgent and needy prayers can be laced with thanksgiving. We can thank him for allowing us to draw near as sinful people. We can thank him that his promise to provide for all that we need. We can thank him that he loves us and he cares for us and that as a father he watches over us like a father does his child. We can thank him even as we are sharing our request with him. Those requests might be small. It might be, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm wandering around the parking lot. There doesn't seem to be a space. Could you, could you please provide? I remember hearing a story one time about somebody's mother or grandmother who said, I don't know how else you would find a parking spot without praying for it. And I thought, well, that's exactly is what the author was saying. That's exactly right. You wouldn't. You're not strong enough to lift up every car and make sure a spot lands right in front of where you need it. We, we, we assume that because God is so ongoingly generous with us, we start to assume that it is our power bringing those things about. The reality is God is often giving us things even without us asking him. But he intends us to be living in a state of continually asking him. In everything, make your requests known to God with thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord. I trust you. Look at all that you provided for me, but let me now bring this request to you. My, my, my child is disobeying today, Lord. Would you please help them to see their need for obedience? This machine in my house is broken. Would you please provide for us or help us to see how we can live without it? 
Lord, my, my friendship is struggling. Would you please provide for this reconciliation here, Lord? Well, Lord, my, my marriage is weak. Would you please give strength to it, Lord? My health is failing. Would you please provide for what I need medically or heal me miraculously? Lord, Lord, let me live in continually asking you. I'm casting, I am rejecting the idea that problems are meant to be kept in my mind, to be solved by my own intelligence. Worry solves nothing, but more importantly, worry is saying no to God. Worry that we indulge in is telling God no. God says, come to me. Bring your requests to me. Let me hear them. Worry says no. No. Or not. We'd rather worry. And we do that because worry gives us the illusion of control. Worry is like, it's a little bit like self pity. Self pity is just disappointed pride. Self pity says, I wish I was amazing. I'm not amazing, but I wish I was. It's just pride that's been disappointed. Arrogance is pride bragged about. I am amazing. Self-pity says, I wish I was amazing. Worry says, I wish I could control this. I want to be the one that can control this. Sometimes confidence is just pride on display. I am controlling this. The person in relationship with Jesus says, you are controlling this, and I want it no other way. Do not be anxious about anything, anything, church, anything. We're called to be prayerfully trusting, and that command comes with a promise. Paul says, the peace of God, the peace, and that phrase, of God, it's, it's God's own peace. It's the peace that he has because he's God. How peaceful is God? Well, how peaceful would you be if you controlled everything and you knew everything? Pretty peaceful. <laughs> Nothing happens that you didn't know was going to happen, and you control it when it does happen. There's not a lot of reason to worry when that is your condition, and that's the peace that he promises to give to us if we will pray. Another marker of relationship, if you're consistently not experiencing peace, it's probably because you're consistently worrying instead of praying. It's not because the outcome hasn't come yet. It's not because the condition hasn't changed. Peace is not a result of changing conditions. It's a result of prayer. What a different way to view life. We tend to assume peace is a result of changing conditions. Paul says, no, peace has nothing to do with your condition changing. It has everything to do with how much you are trusting the Lord and asking him for help. We don't have peace because he answers. We have peace because he promises to give us peace when we ask him. That's a very different way of viewing it. We don't have peace because he answers in a certain way, we have peace because we ask him and he gives us peace. It says it will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The, the word there has to do with a, a battalion of soldiers or a group of soldiers guarding a citadel. Very familiar to, to the Philippians because they had Romans that guarded them because it was a Roman colony. And they would be bringing that to mind. So God's peace is going to be like a guard that comes around my heart and my mind. That's the entirety of my being. This is a peace that, that goes beyond human understanding. It's, it's more than we could think. It will guard your hearts and your minds, and where will it do this? In Christ Jesus. Because you are in Christ, merely making the request to God produces peace. Now tell me you have not experienced this. How many times in your life has it been the case that you're facing some unknown situation 
and there's no obvious solution. You might spend hours strategizing. What about this? What about this? We could change this budget category. How about if we think about this, and I could work over here, and maybe, and you spend hours, and it doesn't have the same effect of peace as if you sit down and spend five minutes saying, Lord, this is a problem. Can I give it to you? And you notice peace begins to rise up in your soul. That's God being faithful to his promise. P.T. O'Brien says about this promise, it is a specific and certain promise about God's peace that is attached to the encouraging admonition of verse 6. Most significantly, this promise about God's peace guarding the Philippians is given irrespective of whether their concrete requests, listen, are granted or not. God's peace will be powerfully at work in their lives as a result of their pouring out their hearts in petition with thanksgiving, not because they have made requests that are perfectly in line with the will of God. What a wonderful thing. You can experience peace simply by praying. Does God often answer prayers? Yes, he does, miraculously. But the peace is available even without the answer. The peace is available simply by living in relationship with Jesus. Living in relationship with God. Living as if he is to us who we say he is in our confession. Rejoice. Be gentle. Be prayerfully trusting, not anxious thankful. You wrap all of that lifestyle up. What does it have in common? Relationship with God through Christ. It's a, it's a relational paragraph. Come to God, he says. Come to me. Come. Bring your troubles. Bring your requests. Bring your burdens. Bring your annoyances. Bring your anxious mind and let me exchange it for peace. Bring your worries and let me bring you comfort. Bring your sense of vulnerability and let me guard you. Bring your sense of depression and sadness and let me bring you joy. Bring your sense of impatience and let me replace it with gentleness. Come to me, this passage says. You were not meant to do life on your own. You are not a very good manager of your life. Come to me. And let me do in you what only God can do. Let your lifestyle, your joy, your gentleness, your peace, let it reveal your relationship to Jesus. Let the Lord of your life shape the character of your life. If the character of our life is not revealing the Lord of our life, what we need to do first is go back to that Lord so he can begin shaping our character again. Now, if, if you're here and you're a non-Christian guest, you're just here attending, listen, let me appeal to you. The, the Lord that we serve is gentle and gracious and eager to give you joy and peace. That is the God of the Bible. He does not promise automatically to give you a more financially wealthy life. He doesn't promise to make your dogs live longer. He doesn't promise to make your house bigger. He promises to give you himself. And trust me, having God is better than everything else. He promises to forgive all of your sins if you repent of them and come to him for forgiveness. He promises to give you peace if you will hand your life over to him. Our lives should reveal our relationship with Jesus. Do our days reveal this relationship? If they don't, because of who God is, we don't have to do any kind of massive work to earn back his favor to start changing that. You can start changing that tomorrow. You can start changing that this afternoon. You can come to the Lord. You can rejoice in the Lord. You can let his gentleness towards you be reflected in your gentleness to others. You can do this as you draw near to him, casting all of your cares, including your cares about not living up to this passage, on the one who cares for you. 
Are you convicted of some area in this passage? I am. Some area where I, I'm not joyful like that. Not always. And I'm often pretty anxious. And I'm definitely not gentle. Good. There you go. Now you have burdens. Now you have burdens. The Bible has done what it meant to do. It, gave, it just revealed the real burdens that you have. The real convictions. Guess what you can do? Take those burdens and give them to the God of mercy and forgiveness and allow him to give you his peace. You can do that right now. Immediately. You, you, don't, you don't have to do anything other than just saying, Lord, I, I feel conviction that I am not revealing in my life the lifestyle of one who is living close to you. <laughs> I had another moment with the same young child. <laughs> where I was greeting him warmly and he happened to be engaged with a, a little show that he loves and I'm, I'm greeting him and he says like sort of acknowledging me I have to watch this right now <laughs> and it was cute and fun and it was great but as the Lord often does I experienced a little bit of conviction because I thought, you know what, Lord? That's like me. I have to do this right now. And he says to us, come. Whatever you're doing, I guarantee I'm better. Rejoice in me. Let your gentleness be known to others because I'm at hand. Don't be anxious. Bring your request to me and I will give you my peace. Let your life reveal your relationship with Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we want to take a moment right now and respond immediately to this word. Lord, we're so thankful. We don't have to take a number or make an appointment. Lord, we don't have to schedule it this week. We can just immediately come to you. You have spoken to us in your word. You have said to come to you, to rejoice in you, to reflect you. So, Lord, we're coming to you right now. We're casting our cares, our burdens on you, even the burden of conviction for being too busy for you. And we are drawing near to you and declaring that you are what we want, what we need. We are running towards you in the middle of this moment of life. Receive, Lord, our affection, our repentance, our joy, our requests.